Folks, the energy in the room is strong. Those who are watching on the live stream, I'm glad you've tuned in. This is one that nobody's going to want to miss, nobody should miss. I'm filled with a lot of joy right now. I got to have dinner with a rabbi, a man I respect very much. For those who don't know, and it seems like everybody knows Rabbi Klein already, the uh, Jewish geography is, is just endless. And so for those who haven't seen Rabbi Klein in a while, remember him from various life cycle events or connections. I'm really happy to hear that. And it's just a great personal joy for me to be able to have Rabbi Klein sharing his wisdom with us tonight on a topic that I know will speak to all of us as we go into this high holiday season, the topic of forgiveness. We have in just a couple of, right, a couple of days, Slichot. Slichot is all about kind of learning how to keep our side of the street a little cleaner. When it comes to the people through the year that we've done things that were not quite right to, whether it was intentionally, whether it was unintentionally, how can we hold that mirror up to our lives and be honest about it and then go and do the work of keeping our side of the street a little clean or at least just dusting it off. And then there's the other side too, which I think is really the side that's going to be the essence of what Rabbi Klein speaks to tonight. What about those people who have harmed us? What about those people when you think of them, when you think of their name, when you picture them in your mind, you just burn with that, oy, how could they have done it? That frustration, that resentment. And I always like to mention that word resentment, sentire, to, to feel, and re, again, resentment, to feel the pain, to feel the hurt again and again and again, and to have to live with that. It's hard. So how do we drop it? How do we start to do the spiritual work of loosening that just a little bit? That's what we're here to learn tonight. And I can think of no better person to come and share the wisdom of a lifetime in the rabbinate, and especially on this topic, uh, than Rabbi Klein. I'm just honored to have him. It's a joy to share him with you and to share you all with him. And I'd like to also just say a, a very special toda rabah to Bob and Judy Groman who are here tonight. This learning of this evening is in honor of Bob's uh, mother, Rita Groman, a blessed memory. So thank you for sponsoring the, uh, the sweets that we're going to have and the program for tonight. Without further ado, friends, Rabbi Charles Klein. Thank you, Rabbi Derma. And really, it's so good to walk into a sanctuary and be known. You know, I had, I was telling Rabbi Derma ye that yesterday I walked into my shul and I was there for 44 years. So I'm trying to act pleasant to people, you know, still. And a young woman walks into the office. 44 years I'm there. I have a picture in the hallway. And I said very nicely to this woman, hello, welcome. She looks at me and she asks, who are you? <laughs> I knew at that moment I was retired. I want to thank everyone, all of you, and really it's, as Rabbi Derma said, it's from all walks of life. I mean, Kew Gardens Hills, where I began my rabbinate back in 1975, Glen Eagles Country Club in Delray Beach, um, you name it, there are connections throughout this room. People I've met at sad moments of life when Rabbi Katz wasn't here and I was asked to, to step in. I'll, I'll be talking to Rabbi Katz actually next Wednesday. We have a group, a, a rabbi's group we started many years ago. It's the the AK group of rabbis, 
uh, Rabbi Lucius from Beth Shalom, Rabbi Androfi, Rabbi Kershan, Rabbi Katz, myself. We've been meeting, we were in the seminary together, you know, 50 years ago. So we all still meet every four, five, six weeks by Zoom and catch up with each other and chat with, with each other. And uh, I'll be speaking to Rabbi Katz uh, in that context next Wednesday. So I'll make sure to send your best to him as well. I do want to thank, as Rabbi Derma did, Bob and Judy Groman for sponsoring this evening. May, where are Bob and Judy? I want to place faith. May your mother's neshama have an aliyah by virtue of this evening and all you do to remember her. You know, I had the uh, pleasure, the great pleasure of meeting a young man out in California. I flew out there one night got to an interview the next morning. I had taken, can I say this on the live stream, Ambien the night before. And I walked, it was all a daze to me. But I looked at his resume and it said Brandeis University, and I'm a, an alum of Brandeis. And I said, Brandeis? That's good enough for me. And that began a relationship with your wonderful, terrific, superb rabbi. And I will tell you honestly, if all I did in my career was to play a role in his rabbinic development, I would say Dayenu, because I'm so proud of him and so really, really proud that our relationship went from senior rabbi, assistant rabbi, which is a difficult relationship, difficult relationship at times, to a relationship of, of real friends. And I count him as a real friend, and I, I just want you to know that I couldn't be prouder of, of your rabbi, and I hope you are as well. Um, I want to thank Kaylee for a delicious dinner, Rabbi Kaylee, and she's doing incredible work. I believe so much in clinical pastoral education and what she's doing there. I was a real proponent of it when I was actually, had a meaningful role in Jewish life in, in New York City and uh, in the metropolitan area. So I want to tell you a little story, and I'm going to get into forgiveness, but as Rabbi Derman knows, I can't begin a talk without a joke. And... You know, poor Rabbi Derma. By the time he came along, I had told every joke that there was in Jewish life. And this poor guy would stand up at the lectern, you know, and he would say, I want to tell you a story. There was a person who, and he would look at the crowd in the congregation, and they'd say, oh, yeah, that, the punchline is this, you know? And he could never escape it. Every story, every story he knew he, that had already been told before. If you hear him say, land the plane. <laughs> when he came, you know, he liked to give, he thought that because I gave long sermons, he should give a long sermon. So I used to say to him after a few minutes, I would be sitting back there, and he would be circling around in the sermon, and I would yell out. I would say, not yell out, but I would say, land the plane already. <laughs> land the plane. <laughs> right? So anyway, if you hear that, no, know where it's coming from. So anyway, there's a story about this young Jewish guy, 38 years old, Sean, brings Jennifer home to meet his parents. 38 years old, finally, finally, a serious, serious relationship. He says, Mom, Dad, can I talk to you in the kitchen? Brings him into the kitchen, says, Mom, I think she's the one. And the mother says, are you really sure about this? Positive? I don't know. No, Mom. I'm really sure. This is the one. So she said, if you're sure, 
Sean, if you're sure about it, I want to give her a special gift. I have a bracelet that I'd like to give her. Oh, Mom, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. She'll be so moved. So Sean's mom goes into the bedroom, comes back with a bracelet, and says, I'd like to give you this bracelet, Jennifer. She places it on her wrist. Jennifer looks at the inscription on the bracelet. And Sean asks, Jennifer, what does it say? And Jennifer says, Sean, I think it's so touching that you should read it aloud and let everyone know what your mother has inscribed on this bracelet. So he takes the bracelet, turns it around. It says, do not resuscitate. <laughs> so I think it would be hard for Sean's mother to seek forgiveness from Jennifer. And yet, that's what this evening is all about. It's about forgiveness. I wrote this book years ago, How to Forgive When You Can't Forget. As I'll talk about in the course of my talk this evening, I'm working on another book, Writing Away, and I mean writing because I'm one of the few people left on this planet that actually will only write with a pen and a pad. Okay, Rabbi Derma would come into my office and he'd say, what is that on your desk? I said, it's called a legal pad. You use it to write with, to write what you're doing. So I'm writing it longhand to be put on computer, of course. It was 25 years ago that a very, very talented alum of Brandeis University also, Mitch Album wrote that wonderful book, Tuesdays with Maury. I loved that book. Many of you did. I still do. Professor Maury Schwartz, just to remind you, because looking around, reminding doesn't hurt any of us at this stage. He was a professor at Brandeis University. And when he was dying of ALS, Mitch, who was his student there, and Maury had a reunion. And many of you know the book offers some of the inspiring, deep, wonderful insights of Maury Schwartz. And there was a special, special beauty and power to what, to what Maury was imparting. And one of the great lessons that Maury taught was that there is no point in keeping vengeance or stubbornly resisting forgiveness. And he told Mitch a story about a friendship that had imploded in his life. When Maury's wife was dying, he looked to this friend for support, as we do from friends. The friend just wasn't there. It was called a lapse, a lapse in their friendship. Anyway, the friend came to understand that he had disappointed Maury and actually went to apologize to apologize. And Maury, as wise as he was, would not accept his apology, which, by the way, as Jews, we're not permitted to do. We're not permitted not to accept an apology. And that lapse, that lapse led to the destruction of a friendship, and Maury found out that the friend died. And you can see it 
on the videotapes, Maury cried because he had never, ever forgiven his friend. How many people, how many of us, have allowed these disappointments to grow into resentments and then anger and then estrangements. Sometimes I ask someone, why did you separate yourself from your family? And the answer will be, it's been so long ago I don't even remember. Maury's story is a reminder of what can happen when we allow a hurt to metastasize, when we withhold our forgiveness, when maybe forgiveness is justified and called for by us, when we dig our heels in unnecessarily. It was over 30 years ago now that I wrote this book on forgiveness, and I've returned to the topic over and over. Somehow, I'm just drawn to it. I was writing another book, and then it happened about six months ago. My wife, Betty, is here, and she said, how is the writing coming along? I said, oh, I'm writing a different book now. Because there was something about forgiveness, and I'll tell you what it was in a moment, that just pulled me back into the topic. Speak with any rabbi, and he or she will tell you that if you're officiating at a life cycle event today, and there are four children, bet, make a bet, that one of them has no relationship with the parent. Take your bet. If you're officiating at a funeral, and there are three children, take a bet that one of the children doesn't talk to the other two. We see this in every moment of life. I got a call a few weeks ago, you know, I'm I'm a rabbi emeritus, so occasionally people still think I'm capable of doing something, and I was asked to do an unveiling. But not one unveiling, two unveilings. And why? Because the children couldn't be together at the cemetery at the same time. It happens over and over again. I don't know about, maybe it's just me, I attract these people. You know, maybe they just want to be fodder for a new book, but I seem to meet them all the time. There is a real problem today And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But if I did, you would say that in your family or a family close to you or someone you know, there is a deep, long-lasting, painful, horrific estrangement across the generations. But it's a cultural issue as well. 30 years ago, I saw it as an issue, but it's always been. But now it has become something different. We live in an unforgiving age. It's an age of anger. It's an age of demonization. An age of cancellation. You don't like someone, you're canceled. Someone does something wrong, you're out of my life. You are dead to me. It's become culturally acceptable today to remain angry, in conflict, and divided. So we've come now to this special time in our year. It's a sacred season. It's a time for reckoning, as Rabbi Derma said, Reckoning with our deeds, our words, our attitudes, our performance as human beings. How we've conducted ourselves as friends, as family members, as colleagues. From the spiritual heights, and I hope you're working towards that because I take this time of the year very seriously. 
This is the time of the year when I'm trying to tune up. When I'm trying to find what is my better self? How do I transcend who I was last year? And so from these heights, we're looking for our place in this world this year. From these heights, we're trying to find a pathway that may take us away from resentment, anger, and turn our hearts back to people who were at one time very important to us. After 45 years in the rabbinate, I've learned that almost everyone I've met has known what it is to be wounded, disappointed, betrayed by someone close. As one colleague once said to me, he said, the only happy families I know are families I don't really know. And that is, that is the case, and now I remember, remember his name was Rabbi Joseph Telushkin. Okay, it takes me a while sometimes. People that we would have assumed would come through for us, would be there for us when we needed them, like Maury thought of his friend. They don't always come through. And what do we do with those feelings, that disappointment, that can morph into anger and can lead to estrangement? These days, our machzor will tell us what? What we have done in the year just past, we wrote it with our own hand. And what we will do in the year to come, we'll write that too. And so we take control over our life, over our feelings, over our emotions, over our actions, and we decide, will we be redeemed and liberated from the feelings that have taken us out of the life of someone else? Rabbi Derma may remember, because I know he listened intently to every word I said, every word. But on Rosh Hashanah two years ago, we were still really in the midst of, the, of COVID. And I speculated in my sermon that the pandemic would bring about a reset in people's lives. I thought, I really, really thought that living through that trauma, which was horrific when you remember it, every day, 10,000 more people dying, the funerals where no one could be there, family members isolated one for the other, the pictures of old parents in the nursing home not able to see their children and just waving to each other for months and months and months. The calls I would hear and I would get from people that they couldn't visit a dying mother, couldn't get into the hospital. I really thought, and I, I'm not Pollyannish, I'm from New York. We're not Pollyannish from New York, we understand life. I really thought that we would take from this experience some of the deepest lessons about what was important in life, and we would change. That people would at long last get it, that so much of the stuff that gets between people is just so unnecessary and could be left behind if people tried. I really thought that people would grow wiser, that they would understand what a waste of time it is to just be angry and unforgiving, that our appreciation of just being with people who meant something to us would overflow and we would forget about some of the things that happened. But, you know, I don't understand it. 
I predicted it. It should have happened. It hasn't. So I have the chutzpah to believe that if I write another book, I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to make it happen. So I'm writing this book about forgiveness because I do believe that we have a message, the Jewish people have a message to deliver to the world about forgiveness. That was our message, by the way. You talk about forgiveness and it starts in the Bible. God is the first entity in human history to forgive. But until I wrote my book, believe it or not, the Jewish voice on forgiveness had not been heard. It was remarkable to me that all, from all over the world, what I heard was, thank God someone has written something about forgiveness from a Jewish perspective. So I'm writing this other book because I do believe that it is our core value. It's a core value of our tradition, of our people, that relationships matter, that decency and respect and love one for the other does matter, and that if we lose it, we lose it forever. And I don't know what kind of society that leads to. We already have an inkling of that society all around the world. Yom Kippur especially makes very clear if you want to seek forgiveness from God, you've got to deal with people first. There is no detour. Yom Kippur says no detour. You've got to deal with forgiveness with other people. Then you can deal with the divine. Some of you grew up in shuls. I did. Flushing, New York. Flushing, New York. Where before Yom Kippur, before Kol Nidre, it was really a time for Mechila. I remember sitting in the, in the chapel and we would constitute a little bait in three people and everyone would come up one after the other looking for forgiveness. We even did that Kurt and Kugarn Hills with Rabbi Kirschblum. God willingly took second place. Deal with people. That's who we're, uh, that's what we're about. And once you deal with that, God, God's a pushover. I advocate for forgiveness because I believe in it, because I've seen the elation in people. People coming up after Yom Kippur a week later saying, oh, does anyone come back? Some of my people came back after Yom Kippur. Coming up and saying, you know, I did what you suggested. I called my sister. Thank you. I don't believe in absolving people from the wrong they've done. I don't believe in condoning it. And I do believe that in Judaism, yes, forgiveness takes place in the fullness sense of the word when when someone becomes responsible for what they've done. And when the person who has been hurt turns to that other person and there's a new understanding about what they need from each other to make this work. When the person who has been hurt said, I am willing to leave my resentment and anger back, just give me something that we can build a new life on. People, people will wait. They will wait 
and wait and wait. And they will delay forgiveness. They will hold their ground, hold on to their grievances, remain affirmed in their righteousness, and then it will be too late. Too late in the game. It takes too long to understand how to live the life that we've been given. It takes too long. And it's not fair that it takes so long. But it does. You know, I'm a, I'm a, a lover of the music of Leonard Cohn. This time of the year, Leonard Cohn was always on in my home study because he was my muse for high holiday sermons. He wrote these words. We may never know why Time is in limited supply. Let it slip by. It can never be rewound. And people don't appreciate that. You know, I often think of the heartbreak I often think of the heartbreak when I'm at a funeral of a parent that hasn't heard from a child for decades. How is it possible for decades? What could that parent have done to deserve that? And yet, the closing of the heart, the hardening of the heart, it happens over and over again. And I understand, because I've counseled people just two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I received a call from someone who had read my book. You know, it's, it's, it's years later. I'm always, it's always curious to me. Someone just reads it. It was on the best sell. No, it wasn't. So... And she said, you know, I've been the victim of domestic abuse. How can I forgive my husband? Don't think I had an answer, because I don't. There are certain violent acts, ruptures of trust, wounds that go so deep. They are so hard to forgive. And then there are the other wrongs and the other disappointments and the other failings that I just won't believe have to remain enduring and punishing. I had a call just a week or so ago from someone I know. She's telling me the story about her father dying. And she said, you know, my sister hasn't seen us, her siblings, or my father in years and years. I'm so angry, he's dying, and she won't come. So she said to me, my father was in his last day. I knew it was his last day. I called my sister and I said this to her, Daddy is dying. Say something to him. And she put the phone next to her father's ear, and the daughter was able finally to say something to her father. And the father said, I love you. And I asked her, what made you do that? After all you've been through with her, what made you do it? Because that's what I'm interested in. She said to me, my father's dying made me realize that this had gone on too long. 
that we'd lost too much already. And I was going to take the most dramatic step I could to try to bring my sister back into the family orbit. I know that we can't forget what was done to us. Who can? No one forgets. How to forgive when you can't forget. We can't forget what was left undone. And yet, I do believe that forgiveness is still possible. Forgiveness can still happen. Forgiveness happens when we are ready to give up our anger enough. Ready to give up some of that hurt that we feel, however justified it may be. To see if there is some sign of change and growth in the one who hurt us. Joseph did that in the Bible, in the Torah. Joseph forgives his brother because his brothers, because he has the impression from what he's seen that they take ownership for the wrong they've done and that they're going to be different in the future. And he forgives them for that treacherous act of throwing him into the pit and selling him into slavery. Forgiveness happens when we see that other person and we open our heart and mind to the possibility that that person like us is imperfect yet capable of change. There there are great teachers of forgiveness, great teachers. There's a fellow named Paul Coleman, Dr. Paul Coleman. He's a brilliant, brilliant therapist. And what he writes about, and you'll see the tie-in in a moment to the high holidays, and with that I'm going to wind down. He says that we need everyone, if you feel this anger, we need to find a staging area. And he said, if you're climbing Mount Everest, you don't go straight to the top. You find a base camp, and there you make your camp. And you look up and you look down and you decide how far you're going to go the next day. How far above that are you going to go? Where are you going to make your next base camp? Because you just can't go from the, le- from the, from the ground of Mount Everest to the top. You've got to have a staging area, a base camp. And he said the same thing holds true with forgiveness. When we get angry, you know what we do. We go one side, the other side. Anger leads people further and further away from one another. And he said, take your time. Be angry. Be angry. But then find your place in a staging camp where you can begin to move to the next level, the next emotional zone. You're not ready to give up all your anger, all your disappointment. Give up some of it so that you can give up more in the future. Let yourself be led higher because of an awareness of who you are. And this is the heart of the matter. Who are you? Are you an angry person? Are you a person who will allow himself or herself to just be controlled by disappointment? What will the legacy of your life be? Or will you, will you say, my soul is calling for me to try to reach beyond where I am right now? That's that's our challenge for this year. 
every year. To choose to move to that staging area. Yes, about forgiveness, but about anything we do in life that bothers us. That staging area that allows us the vantage point of going higher. La'ela u la'ela. We'll start saying that very soon. Higher and higher. We don't stay low. What did Michelle Obama say? When they go low, we go high? That's, that's us. There's no point to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur unless you say to yourself, I want to go higher. I want to reach higher. When you ask every morning in the Siddur, Ma chayeno, what's my life about? My life isn't about staying the same person I was last year. You want a successful year? Remind yourself who you are right now and then, God willing, when we come to the next year, you say to yourself, did I change? Was I wiser? Did I go up that next rung? Was I able to forgive a little bit? Bring a relationship back into place. And one other point. For those of us, for those of us who have done wrong, oh, I know. What wrong could we do? How could we hurt anybody? We're nice people. And you are. We're all nice people. There are disappointments. There are times when we don't come through as much as we could. There are times we say a harsh word. There are times that we, that we just hurt, not maliciously, but just because we're human. And our tradition has something to say about that as well. If we may have left scars on the soul of another person, we need this time, any day, this time, to look honestly at ourselves, to understand that any one of us is capable of doing wrong. It's a beautiful line in the Siddur every morning. If you come late to shul, and I heard from Rabbi Derma, everyone comes at the starting time here. But if you come late to shul, no matter where they are in the service, look at pages, you seem shalom? Look at pages 64, 65, 63. Those are the best prayers in the whole Siddur. What does it say there? Lolam Yehei Adam Yerei Shemayim. A person should always be in awe of God. Mode al emet. Acknowledge the truth. The dover emet bilvavo, and speak the truth in his or her heart. A person should always acknowledge the truth, the truth about ourselves. Not cover it up, not conceal it. Every day we should acknowledge the truth of what we are responsible for, to judge ourselves honestly. To admit not just the truth that we'd like to hear, but the truth that we must hear. And if necessary, seek forgiveness. These are days, but it's always time to seek out the highest expectations that come from God, that come from within and to channel our awareness of those higher expectations into the life that needs to be changed. My friends, one last teaching.
from the ethics of the fathers. Rabbi Eliezer said, Shuv yom echad lifnei mitatach. Do teshuva, return one day before you die. So Rabbi Eliezer's students say, Rabbi, how do we know when we're going to die? So you know. So Rabbi Eliezer said, so repent every day. Change every day. Take the first step towards forgiveness because tomorrow is never guaranteed. And remember that Maury, the wise Maury, who oh, I never studied with at Brandeis, did you? No, we took serious subjects, right? You were a philosophy major, yeah, as I recall. Because the wise Maury, he waited too long. He didn't do the tshuva that he could do, and that's why he cried, that's why he wept. I have seen families live with the pain of estrangement for decades. I've also seen families decide that this ends here and with us. Decide that we're not going to live, leave a legacy. A person deciding he or she is not going to leave a legacy of anger, of estrangement, of division, separation. That they're going to find a way to write that legacy and to make their future much more appealing. Friends, our world is cold enough it's unforgiving enough. It's brutal. It's a brutal world. It's not the world we grew up in. Although we certainly knew a world in which family members didn't speak to other family members, that's for darn sure. But the nature of the world has changed dramatically. And we, however, were never intended to be a part of that kind of world. We were intended to build a very different world. The worst Jewish heresy is to say, it is what it is. We have never, ever believed that about anything. Forgiveness about our Jewish character about the love, about the goodness that we can bring into the world. So let me read to you this, this little story as I conclude. It's a story about a painter whose latest work was being unveiled before a gathering of art critics. They were scrutinizing the painting when one critic noticed what he felt was a glaring oversight by the artist. Called out to the artist, Sir, I see that the door to the house in the painting has no handle. Was that deliberate? And the painter responded and said, This door is symbolic of the human heart. And there's no handle because it can only be opened from within. Shana Tova, everybody. How about a Yesha Koach for a beautiful talk? I just hope that Rabbi Klein's words landed not only on your ears, but on your hearts, and that his words, like a shofar, will have the power to wake us up to the spiritual work that we know we should be doing in the weeks ahead. So, yes, your co-author again.